Good morning. It is such a wonderful pleasure and privilege to be here with you, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Price, uh, your wonderful Dean of Chapel, and all the chapel assistants for certainly making it so welcoming to be back here. It was interesting as I was uh, thinking about it, this past September makes 30 years that I started my MDiv here at Gordon-Conwell. And um, how time flies. And for, so, for those of you that are struggling through your first semester or your last semester, before you know it, you'll be here as well. And uh, saying 30 years ago, this is where I started. Uh, it has been a lifelong dream, actually, to be able to participate in chapel. I've always thought about, I love this chapel, I love the design of it. I would often come and sit and meditate here. And to be able to be asked, invited to uh, bring a message uh, is just a thrill. And I thank God for that. Uh, so it's with a great sense of humility that I come to engage in the sacred task of preaching the immutable uh, word of God. I was informed that the theme of uh, this academic year is prayer. And uh, again, in my humble opinion, if you develop a good spiritual discipline of prayer, you will have it made. Because when it's all said and done, uh, if you have accomplished anything without prayer or with just a little bit of prayer, you have not accomplished what God has called you to do. Because it all has to do with prayer. At our church, my constant prayer for us as a church is, God, make this house a house of prayer and make us a people passionate about prayer. Because there's nothing that delights God more than just being present with him. So at this time, I want to ask you, if you wouldn't mind, if you are able to stand as we read God's word, I want to read from uh, Exodus chapter 3. Verses 1 through 4, Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. This is the inerrant, infallible, life-transforming, living word of God. It says, Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burnt up. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us the grace today to recognize the stirrings of your spirit within our soul and to listen most attentively to all that you have to say to us. Do not let the noises of this world so confuse us that we cannot hear you speak. Help us in all things to obey your will. Help us to hear from you. It is in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray this prayer. And together we say, Amen. You may be seated. I've entitled my message, How Observant Are You? How Observant Are You? Uh, when we talk, talk about prayer, our basic definition of prayer is basically us talking to God or talking with God or sometimes even demanding of God to fulfill our needs. Can we agree on that? That's our basic sense of prayer. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, for instance, it says, and if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So there's an invitation of us praying. Uh, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah said, call to me and I will answer you. Matthew 7, 
It says, Jesus, ask and it will be given to you. There's a sense as we go through Scripture, there's a lot of, there are a lot of passages that tell us, call on God. So prayer becomes almost, we initiate this whole concept of calling upon God. But Matthew 6, verse 8 says, Do not be like them, the hypocrites, for your Father knows what you need before you ask of Him. So I want to shift our prayer paradigm slightly this morning to move away from the fact that we think we're the ones initiating prayer when really it is always God who initiates prayer. And if we can understand that and pay more attention to God and be more present with God to hear from him, that maybe our world will be different and our ministry certainly will be different. In this text in Exodus chapter 3, which I have read over and over again, uh, it got my attention some time ago as I read it once more, which proves to us that God is able to speak to us in different ways at different times for different purposes through his word that never changes. Have you ever heard these statements? Take time to smell the roses. And then you can go on the other extreme of it where you have some people that say, I only have one speed and it's fast. Right. So we take we take pride sometimes in being busy. Our society encourages us always to be on the move, because after all, time is money. Well, there's one phrase that has impacted my life over 20 years. And this phrase is this. God is always at work around us. And you probably have. Heard it from the study Experiencing God from Henry Blackaby. It impacted my life to recognize that God is always at work around us. And if God is always at work around us and we want to please him, uh, then maybe we need to see what he's doing. And so often we miss what he's doing. So I want us to be able to begin to pay attention to what God is doing around us. Our responsibility is to see what God is doing and then join him in what he's doing and not try to do our own thing. We all coming together to get an education because we have a sense of purpose, we have a goal, there's something we wanna do. But if you have not allowed God to really begin to put in you what he wants to do, how he wants to use you, you will miss the boat. Because we can all accomplish great things but they will be void of satisfaction and fulfillment if it was not what God asked you or asked me to do. After all, Jesus told us in his prayer, as he taught his disciples, it says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane said, not my will, but your will be done. So let's take a quick moment here to begin to extract the pearl from the Exodus chapter 3 as we sort of switch this paradigm of prayer. In verse 2 it says, the, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and as he looked, behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. The insight here is this. The Lord appeared in the bush, but said absolutely nothing. He appeared, but said absolutely nothing. The Lord appeared, and, and he appears to each one of us, and how he appears to us is never the same, but there's a sense that there's a desire, a joy, for God to minister to us and to speak to us as his children. Do you believe that God is always at work around you? Can we agree with that? All right. If so, let me ask you a more pertinent question. How has God appeared around you lately? Because sometimes there's a sense that, you know, five years ago I had this encounter with God. It was awesome. Ten years ago, I can remember how wonderful it was. The question is, is God still working today? Because if he is, 
He is appearing. He is still working around us every single day. How has he appeared around you lately? And the real question is this. Are we slowing down enough to notice him? Are we slowing down enough to notice him? Moses noticed something, a burning bush. Again, verse 2 says that Moses looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. I'm sure that Moses must have stopped long enough and stared at it and realized, wait a second, this bush is burning and yet is not being consumed by the fire. So he could have been preoccupied and missed the whole thing. And this is where, especially at seminary, uh, this word preoccupation becomes very important. Preoccupations will always get the best of us. With so many things going on in our lives, it's hard to stop and take the time to notice things that are happening around us. Things which God is deliberately putting in front of us. Verse 3, it says, so Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burnt up. I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burnt up. Moses stopped all that he was doing so he could observe what was happening around him. If Moses turned aside to look, that means that most likely he had passed it by, but then something in the back of his mind said, you know what, that, that's kind of strange, that's kind of different. Let me go back and pay attention to what's happening. This bush is burning, but it's not being consumed. Moses made a deliberate decision to go back. I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight why the bush is not burnt up. Now, seminary life is very hectic. Some of you are single. Some of you have spouses. Some of you have family obligations. Some of you have papers to write, exam to study for, midterms, as Joseph mentioned earlier. And uh, you can't wait to wrap this thing up called seminary, get your diploma, and ride into the sunset of a peaceful, less hectic environment of pastoral ministry <laughs> or the mission field in some exotic, unreached people group or entering the, re the realm of academia. Now, without bursting your romanticized bubble of what it will be like once you leave seminary to enter any of these areas, I want you to know, in the famous words of Frank Sinatra, in a reverse fashion, if you can't make it here, you can't make it anywhere. <laughs> if you can't make it here, you can't make it anywhere. Because you need to de develop the disciplines right now that's going to carry you through the rest of your life. This is just not a, a stepping stone. This is part of your life. This is what God has called you to. And we need to develop these disciplines now, um, chapel has meant a lot to me, both at Gordon College and, and Gordon-Conwell, because these are wonderful schools that bring out incredible preachers. Uh, and one of the things that blessed me is that every time I came to chapel, I would listen and take notes. And I noticed none of you are taking notes, but that's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. We're taking notes. All right, good. All right, good. Just want to make sure. But I would come to chapel because this is a sacred time. It is more important than any of the other classes you're going to, or maybe just as important at least. I would listen to the preacher. I would take notes, and then I would go to my dorm room, and I would process the nuggets of each of those messages. I would turn them into a prayer or an action step. Because this is important. This is what carries us. Because when you leave here, you're going, to be, you're going to need to do the same thing. Listen to what God is saying to you. Process it. If you need it as a prayer, pray it. 
If you need it as an action step, move forward with it. So I want to encourage you to make sure that you understand that chapel time is sacred time. God can do, yes, Emmett, it is precious time. I cannot overemphasize that. Because when you leave Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, your life is going to get more hectic than it is right now. The hecticness does not stop. And this is where the discipline continues. And the discipline that you develop here in listening to the Word of God, you, you are probably never going to hear as many wonderful preachers, present company excluded, <laughs> that bring incredible insight from the Word of God. And you have the opportunity to hear those words, to process them, and to put them into, the, into practice. Don't let the distractions hinder you right now. I know it's important to get a good grade, but I, I can remember um, first year, first semester of uh, college, and I, I would be walking around campus. I was at Barrington, and then I transferred when we merged with Gordon College, and everybody's pulling their hair because of finals and midterms and so on. And that was the one time I spent more time in the Word and in prayer. You know, something happens where God is able, when you are focused with Him, that hour that you study is probably worth more than five hours of studying without God. Your mind needs to be at a good place for God. I, I, I felt so often that God suspended time so I can put more into one hour than I could have put in five hours. I'm not saying you don't study, you're not disciplined, you don't do what you need to do. I'm just telling you, God has a way of doing incredible things when we are present with him and focused on what he's doing. So let me just quickly move into the, the key element of this passage here where I'm shifting our whole concept of prayer to a certain extent. Verse 4 says this, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. When we think about prayer, we often think, again, that it's something that we are initiating, as I hinted earlier. But I want to suggest to you that God is the one who initiates prayer. Whenever we have a need, we come to God, but Scripture tells us clearly that God already knows all of our needs. However, in our finite understanding, we don't know what God has for us, and this is the key. We need to find out what God has for us. He already knows what we need. Why do we waste the bulk of our prayer telling God what He already knows instead of spending the time saying, God... I don't know exactly what you're doing, want to do. Can you tell me? Can you inform me? Can you reveal that to me? So here's the main point uh, for us here. In verse 4, when God saw that Moses was paying attention, then God called Moses. Remember in verse 2, the, God appeared in the bush but said nothing. Because Moses was not ready to listen. Moses was not present with God. Moses was not paying attention. But when he turned around to go and look, be present with God, that's when God spoke with him. I often tell people, we can't just, you know, pray on the fly. Yes, we pray all day long. But there's that moment of prayer that, that needs to be sacred, that you're, you're pausing and, and, and waiting on God. In our church, we, we have a beautiful sanctuary, and I make it a practice almost every single day that I'm there to take time away from the office, sit in the sanctuary, and pray. And by praying, I mean just sit in the sanctuary and see if God's going to say something. And I've had more insights, more revelations, more opportunity to transform the church by the things that I heard God speak when I was silent. And this is really my encouragement to you as you, you think about prayer, 
It, it was when Moses stopped, turned around, made a deliberate decision in, in the midst of all the distractions, all the interruptions, because it's easy to get distracted by all these things that happen around us. Um, let me ask you a question. How comfortable are you with God's interruptions? Right? Is it an inconvenience? Are these interruptions constantly challenged by why? God, why, why now? C can't you see that I, I have to study? Can't you see the exam? It's tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Can't you see I have to be at the library? Can, can't you? How do we handle these interruptions? When we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So I, let me ask you this question here. What is happening in your life right now that does not seem to make any sense to you? Could God be trying to get your attention? Could God be trying to get your attention? Now, what would, what would the name Moses mean to us today if Moses had missed that opportunity with God? It would mean absolutely nothing. No legacy. But thank God he listened. See, God is going to accomplish his purpose with you or with me or without you or without me. He's going to accomplish it. He invites us. He calls us. He chooses us. He wants to give us the privilege to be part of what he's doing. God is always at work around us. And some would want to say, as Henry Blackaby says, don't, stand, don't just stand there, do something. And he says, God would, would, would mo most likely want to say, just stand there, right? Let me tell you what to do. The Bible tells us, be still and know that I am God. He says, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. So I want to encourage you today to take the time to slow down, slow down enough, to be attentive enough to what God might want to show you, say to you, or direct you to do. Now, when we think about God interacting with us, now, again, prayer, I said we often want to come to God and give, tell him what he already knows. But we see when God is addressing us, I, I use the word, it's not for chit-chat. See, when we are talking with God, we are chit-chatting with God. But when God is talking to us, he is bringing us a challenge. And that challenge will scare us to death at times. And I think sometimes we don't want to listen. We don't want to hear from God. Uh, it's interesting, I was just given a book by, uh, from uh, Christy Wilson, uh, missionary professor here uh, from some time ago when I started. I have to make a confession here. One of my greatest fears in seminary was that God would call me to be a missionary. And I had to take a missions class with uh, Christy. And he is pretty convincing, pretty powerful. And I was so glad at the end of the class, I did not feel the call to be a missionary. Only to realize, wait a second, God brought me from West Africa to the United States to be a missionary. Not only did he bring me into the United States, he brought me to New England. <laughs> right? Not only he brought me to New England, he brought me to Providence, the least biblically minded city in the country. And then I realize, you know, sometimes we're afraid of things that we shouldn't be afraid of because God has it all together already. I really believe that God sent me here as a missionary to America. But in my own finite thinking, I was afraid of that. And you might be afraid of what God is calling you to do. Thomas Merton said, the biggest human temptation is to settle for too little. And I want you to be open to whatever God is going to say to you. Whatever he wants you to do, he's, he's got it all figured out. 
don't be afraid. Now, so, someone says, well, we, we know the saying uh, that um, God will never give us more than we can handle. How many of you have heard of it? How many of you? No, don't no, no, answer that next question because it's a trick question. The fact of the matter is, God is always going to give you more than you can handle. Because this is God's way of bringing you to a new level of maturity. So God will bring, you are here already, so if God is only going to give you what you can handle here, guess what? There's no growth. What's going to happen is God is going to bring you right here and says, now there's a gap. A pocket of dependency, I call it, that needs to be filled. And the only way it's going to be filled is by you and I be completely dependent on God. So yes, God is going to give you a lot more than you can handle. So you can say, God, without you, I can't do this. And don't be afraid of the fact that when God speaks to you and brings these challenges as he did with Moses and with uh, uh, Abraham and Noah and all the others, brought them to a whole new level to bless them in their maturity. So in conclusion, I want to encourage you. Moses stopped, turned around, made a deliberate decision to go and see what was happening. And that's the only time that God spoke to him. Or that's the time that God spoke to him. The burning bush was there. God appeared to him, said nothing in verse 2. But in verse 4, when he turned around, God spoke to him. You may not be hearing from God, either because you don't want to, you're afraid, or maybe you're preoccupied with things, or maybe you're just not slowing down enough. And, and like I said, if you can't make it here, you won't be able to make it anywhere because when we leave seminary, it gets a lot more hectic. We get a lot busier and things get more complex. So learn to slow down now so you can hear from God. Amen? Amen. Amen.